So, hello everyone. Welcome to lecture nine of information theory. Where are we? We're down here today, down there. Um, a couple of announcements before we begin. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to assign any more reading uh, until after the midterm. Uh, but here's the reading that you should do. You should do this this week and next week. So this is essentially all of the reading that you'll be required for the midterm. So chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 11.1. .1. So if there's any questions about what you should read before the midterm, this is it. Um, we do have one more homework that's due before the midterm, however. And that is due next Tuesday. The 29th at 11.45, the usual deal at this point. It's homework 4. It's posted on the web page now. Should have gotten an announcement about that. I also want to remind you that um, we have office hours every Tuesday. In fact, it was great, actually. I got a little bit of... I still haven't spelled Tuesdays right. So I guess... I don't know how many typos we try to fix. You can always find new ones. Um, people came to office hours on Tuesday, which was great. Um, but again, I'll, like I said, next week I'll have a couple of Canvas office hours in the evening. Uh, and I'll just announce that next week. Um, the midterm's on Thursday, next Thursday, a week from today actually. It covers everything up to it, including homework four, which is today's cumulative reading and, and homework four. So that means that what's on the midterm will include homework stuff from homework four, which includes chapters four and five. And I'll do a review on 1029. Now the other thing about 1029 is that uh, you've probably heard there has been no lack of announcements about Stephen Boyd's lecture. Um, I don't think we can count on both hands the number of reminders we've got about that lecture. So, um, uh, in any event, I think, it's, but in all honesty, he, he actually is a fantastic lecturer. And uh, if only you go to hear him, hear his jokes, I think it's worth going, because he's probably not only one of the best people in convex optimization, but he's also just a very entertaining lecturer, and he makes very funny, I don't know, you just have to see him, he's, he's good. I laugh out loud when I watch him lecture. I mean, there are very few lecturers in the world who on one hand I can go to and obtain something technical and at the same time laugh out loud. And there are very few lecturers who make me laugh out loud, including myself. I don't make myself laugh out loud. So, Anyway, so the problem is that it conflicts with next class. So here's what I'm going to try to do. So uh, half, of, half of Tuesday's lecture is going to be YouTube only. Part of it is going to be in person. And the reason why is that you know, part of that lecture really has to be interactive. There's actually something, it's kind of an unfortunate day for this to be happening on. But there's part of that lecture that we're going to play a game. And you'll see what I mean when we do the lecture. But we're going to play a game in class. It's a fun game. And everybody will participate. It's called the Shannon game. Um, and uh, it's not something you can do on YouTube. So the, that part won't be YouTube. So what I might, we might only do is essentially sort of finish the material and do the game, and then we'll stop. Uh, the other thing I'm going to try to do is I'm trying to find a room just for next week down in EEB so that we can, so we don't have to like stop early and then spend 10 minutes walking down to the EE building. I've already sent in a request. So uh, please watch your email boxes tomorrow and Monday for a possible room update. And I will try to, um, what I'll probably do is over the weekend I will post another, an additional YouTube lecture, or probably about a one hour of YouTube lecture, so that basically what we can do is on um, Tuesday we can essentially just do the Shannon game and then maybe do some mid midterm review and then we'll, we'll cut after an hour, so 50 minutes, whatever. Um, any questions on that? Any confusion? So remember, it's possible we will still be in this room next week, but I don't know. I will try to move it. Okay, just because there are often questions about the midterm early, so when is it next Thursday? It's one hour, 50 minutes length in class. Closed book. You can have one side of one eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper on which you can write anything you wish. It's a cheat sheet, but you can't use the book. 
can't use computers, iPads, laptops, Android phones, Kindles, Palm Pilots, Newtons, um, Apple IIs, no, nothing like that. No uh, IBM 360s. Only one 8.5 by 11 inch sheet of paper. And it can be computer printed. Sometimes I insist upon it being handwritten. It can be computer printed if you want, but I prefer handwritten, but it's up to you. The, the graduate class. I think you will learn more if it's handwritten. And you can actually use this sheet for the final, so you might want to save this sheet. Uh, and for the final, you'll actually have two sides of an eight and a half by 11. So this could be the first half, and then you could save it, and then the final, you could use this and whatever your next sheet is. So it's your cheat sheet. Okay, and, the, and like I said, the lecture will be, uh, the, the, the midterm will be about two hours long. Um, because that's all I'm going to say about the midterm today. I'll talk more about it on Tuesday. But that, that will help you to prepare. So you, you won't say, I didn't have enough time to prepare my sheet. I'm giving you a whole week to prepare your sheet. You can do that while you're doing your homework. Um, so um, all right, so let's do a little bit of review. So on Tuesday, we talked a little bit about the entropy of a random walk. So actually, I don't know what to look at. I can look at the laptop screen, the iPad screen, or this screen. Look at everything. But in any event, we talked about the entropy of the random walk, and we saw how, on the one hand, it might seem a little bit counterintuitive because the entropy of the random walk subtracts off the overall uh, node entropy in, under the stationary conditions. But then when we said uh, you know, it makes sense on the, one, on the other hand, because keeping the overall entropy, the edge entropy, the same, when we make the node entropy smaller, a, a smaller number of nubs, nodes essentially become hubs. And so when you're a hub, you actually have a very, very large degree. And so there's a lot of, once you land on that hub, you're much more likely to land on that hub, and then you have a lot of choice as to where you're going to go next. So um, that increases the overall uncertainty when, the, when, when that yellow term decreases. Uh, secondly, we define a hidden Markov model. And we sort of talked mostly about this one in particular. This is a graphical one where we can look at the conditional independence statements basically by saying, for example, x2 is independent of x4 and x5 given maybe y3. And any graph separation property is a corresponding conditional independence statement in, in, a, in a hidden Markov model. And then from that, we are able to derive upper and lower bounds on the entropy rate of a hidden Markov model, and also show that in a limit of either of these bounds, these limits, these limits, these are sandwich limits that, de, that they're increasingly flattened. They're a flattening sandwich. So at some point, the sandwich becomes a pancake. At some point, the pancake becomes, I don't know, crescent roll? No. What's, what's a really flat kind of bread? Remember? Filo, filo dough. No. Nobody likes food analogies. In any event, that's what happens. And then uh, we started a sort of a new topic, which was the idea of practical coding. This is what we're going to be spending most of today on again, which is the idea. The idea is that you know we do have access to the distribution, p of x. We're not going to say how we get p of x, but we, we do have some p of x, or we have some estimate of p of x, q of x. We're going to talk about that today. So there are a couple of definitions about codes. So a source code is basically a mapping from source symbols to code words. So just to make sure the notation is clear, we have a mapping from source symbols to code words. And code words are sort of extended, you know, possibly variable length extended strings with alphabet D. Uh, we talked about the expected length of a code word. It's just basically the probability. It's expected length of a code is the probability of that source symbol times the length of the corresponding code word, summed over all possible source symbols. Expected length. The notion of non-singularity of a code, which basically says that no code word has more than one source symbol assigned to it. So there's no collisions. So in this picture, there are no arrows on the right-hand side 
converging to the same point. Like this would be a collision if they were both. That's not allowed. The notion of a code extension, this is very simple, where basically we've got a bunch of source symbols and we want to code for the sequence of source symbols, we just concatenate the corresponding code words. So we just literally concatenate. And there's no implicit punctuation in this concatenation. They're just bunched together without any separating symbol between the code words for each source symbol. The definition of uniquely decodable, which basically says that the, the code extension is non-singular. So it has to be the case that for uniquely decodable code, that when we concatenate a bunch of code words together for a bunch of source symbols, that that sequence of concatenated source symbol code words corresponds to one and only one sequence of source symbols. And then a prefix code is one, or it's also called an instantaneous code, it's one where no code word can be a prefix of another code word. So if you get to a code word, there's no continuation of that code word, which is also a code word. So these are, these are essentially a set of constraints. So again, we have the code classes, we have all possible codes, which could be singular. We've got the singular codes, which is a subset. The uniquely decodable codes, which is a subset of that, and the instantaneous codes, which are a subset of that still. And in general, as we become more and more constrained, decoding becomes easier. Like instantaneous codes are easy to decode. We just keep marching down the bit string until we get to a code word. Then we start again, keep marching down the bit string until we get to another code word. There's never any ambiguity because once we get to a code word, we don't have to keep going along in the potential hope or thought that there might be another code word for which the first code word was a prefix of. And that's the case in instantaneous codes can't happen. So it's just very easy. So we get ease, computational ease of coding, computational and memory ease of coding. But on the other hand, it's fewer code words, sorry, fewer codes. So maybe the thought might be that when you put more restrictions on the class of codes, we might lose optimality. Right? Like in other words, is the best is, is the code that achieves the Shannon rate here? Well, maybe there's a better one here that's not in that set. Maybe, I think that's, that idea must be clear. Raise your hand if that's, that idea is clear. I hope that that's idea. Should be pretty clear. So then craft inequality is the thing that connects us from expected lengths to specific instantaneous codes. And it basically says, on the one hand, that if you've got an instantaneous code, over an alphabet size d, then the links must satisfy the following inequality where we sum over all code words of d to the negative length of that code word, that whole sum can't be greater than 1. So the total is sort of like a fractional thing and it can't be greater than 1. And conversely, uh, this, this part we actually proved, 9.1, what we didn't prove is the converse, which is that um, if we've got a set of code words, and satisfy these lengths, there exists an instantaneous code that have these word lengths. So in other words, all we need, this is sort of an, an identical condition to instantaneousness. If we've got any code that satisfies craft that's not instantaneous, we, can, we could form another code which has exactly the same lengths. And um, is instantaneous. And even better, as we will show in the proof of the converse, the construction of an instantaneous code starting from the lengths is actually fairly easy and computationally tractable. So really we can then use um, as a, in some sense, mathematical surrogate for an instantaneous code the set of lengths that satisfy craft. So in other words, the set of lengths that satisfy craft can be a mathematical surrogate for instantaneous code, for an instantaneous code. Okay, so the first part of the theorem, this part we already proved, so I'm not going to go over that again. This part, this is a new bullet from last time. I mentioned it in words, but I, I just want to, I just wrote it in the, in the slide in this version of the talk. 
basically the craft is our connection between instantaneous codes specifically and the ability to compute expected length in finding such a code. Okay, so this is this will be really this is a really really important thing. Okay, so let's not go through the, the first part of the proof again. We already did this, so we um, we get this. Um, you know this this is last this is normally stuff that um, goes in the review, um, but it was right in the middle of the proof and there was no easy way of splitting it, so I just went ahead and put it at the beginning of this lecture. So officially, what we haven't yet done is the converse. So let's start the non-review part. So conversely, let's suppose now we've got a set of lengths that satisfy craft, and the goal then is if we, if we satisfy craft, we want to construct a, a prefix code or, or an instantaneous code that satisfies these lengths. So how do we do this? Okay, so we've got these lengths. And L max is the maximum length. And we know that if we consider this tree, where we're at every node in the tree, we branch, we have D branches, so it's the D array tree. You know, the first level we've got D, branches, at the second level we've got d squared, and third level we've got d cubed, all the way down, and if we expand this tree and make it balanced and everything at the very bottom of the tree, we've got d to the l max terminal nodes. Right? And so when we think about the counting, if we look at it in, in, in sort of, in terms of its fractional relationships, so at level zero of the tree, there exists a fraction one of the descendants um, at each node at that level. There's only one node at level zero, and it constitutes all of the descendants. So at level one, you know, we branch those D. There's D children, and so that means that there's each each node sort of um, corresponds to one D of the descendants of the node. And then at level two, there's one of a D squared. Uh, no. So another one, way of saying this, this isn't clear, is like at level zero, how many nodes are there? That, that, that's all of the nodes at that level. At the next level, any given node is one dth of the descendants at that level. And at the next level, each node is one over d, one dth squared. How do you say that? It's a fraction one over d of the number of nodes at that level and so on and so forth. And in general, the number uh, for any given level, there's a fraction of d to the negative i nodes that are descendants that stem from each of the di nodes at level i. This is from the inverse count, counting, counting, the inverted counting relationships. Okay, so, so that's something that we can use. And basically what we're going to do is use these fractions. We're going to sort of use these length and consume a given set of fractions of the total number of descendants. And we're going to sum up. Then we're going to sum up the fractions and show that the fractions don't sum up to more than one. So remember, we've got a set of lengths that satisfy craft. It's craft is satisfied. So let's sort the lengths in order of increasing order. So we're going to start essentially by constructing code words from doing a tree traversal. And starting with the sort of the shallowest level in the tree. So um, to resort these lengths, there's many lengths as there is code words. And so the, let's start with the smallest length. So choose any node at level S1 at that length. And that will be the code word for that length. So it doesn't matter what it is. We've got this tree. Let's say, that, let's say for some reason the first length is length 2. And let's say D is 4. So then what we would do is then choose, let's, let's just choose this one. Okay, so now what we've done is we've eliminated all, since it's a prefix code, all the stuff below it, all of the rest of this tree we've eliminated. What fraction of the potential vertices or the potential code words have we eliminated? Well, we've eliminated d to the negative 2, that fraction, right? Because there's all the rest of these guys. All these guys are still available, and all these guys are still available. We've only eliminated this. Oops, I shouldn't use that color. So basically, to ensure the prefix property, the node becomes a terminal node. So that idea, we, by eliminating it, 
by saying, okay, there's a code word right here. That becomes a code word. This bit and this bit. And nothing below it can be a code word to ensure the prefix property. And so thus we've eliminated a fraction of d to the negative s1 of the terminal nodes at depth l1, l max. So those guys are gone. They can't be considered. So next we choose any remaining node at level s2. So how many nodes do we have at level two? Well, we have this is the fraction of code words left, and then this is the remaining. So remember, S2 is bigger than or equal to S1. So then th this is the choice of first of the first set of levels, and then S2 is a little bit bigger, and then so then there's going to be this, this many additional co possibilities times this. So it's just combinatorics. And you notice greater than zero. Um, so we have that many choices, and thus we eliminate an additional fraction, separate fraction, d to the negative s2. And so the total fraction of code words, of potential code words, we eliminated as d to the negative s1 plus d to the negative s2. And so we continue this process, and when we do it m times, we've eliminated this fraction of the, of the, of the vertices, or the nodes in the tree. And at each stage, we've retained this instantaneousness property because each time we choose a code word, we eliminate from the running any possible other code words that might use that as a prefix. So they're just gone. We just cut the tree at that, at that branch. But we do know that craft is true, and here's craft. So therefore, once we've done this m times, we haven't eliminated that, the, on the left-hand side of the inequality is the total fraction that we've eliminated, and Kraft says that it's never more than one. So we've never eliminated all that there is to eliminate. At most, we live in it, we've never eliminated more than all there is to eliminate. At most, we've eliminated all of it, but usually, but certainly no more than that. So we won't run out of code words, and so we can complete and assign every source uh, letter a code word. And we've used these links, and the code words have those links, and it's prefix free. And it's actually relatively easy. I mean, you can imagine doing an alg algorithm for doing this. And the code word, you know, the, the actual code words themselves, there are many, many ways of doing this. How many different ways are there of producing code words? That's a good question. I want to answer it. Okay, so now, actually, it turns out that even if we have, in the, in the previous example, we had uh, a finite set of um, lengths, finite set of symbols, but what if we actually had a countably infinite number? So basically, uh, what this says, this is a countably infinite version of craft, and it says, for any countably infinite set of code words that form a prefix set, then it satisfies the... Um, extended craft inequality. And then conversely, if we have any set of lengths that satisfy the sort of kind of the infinite craft, then there exists a prefix code with this length. So let's assume for the moment, and this is sort of an interesting thing, this is, this, this proof you might think, well, why would I care about countably infiniteness? Um, well, the reason why is because when we start talking about arithmetic coding, which we will do so, we will do that probably after, like a, after the midterm. But um, this introduced the concept of using intervals on the unit, subintervals of the unit interval with fractional sort of fractional numbers. And, and so the, the proof of this is sort of critical for understanding arithmetic coding. So before you say, well, there's obviously no count of the infinite coding, coded set of codes in the universe, but actually this set proof technique allows us to do something practical with arithmetic coding. So this is why one, we should all pay attention. So assume, let's say that then we have a prefix code, and maybe there's a count of infinite number of code words, and without loss of generality, let's let the D array alphabet be the integers from 0 to D minus 1. It doesn't matter what the alphabet is, we can just arbitrarily assign that to those integers. 
And let's consider the ith code word. So each code word in the code is going to be finite, right? So each one of these lengths, it's kind of the infinite, but it's still the case that these lengths, it's a little bit bold, these lengths have to be finite, right? So there's a finite length code down here. And let's now expand it in this way. So we're going to expand this code as a fractional number. So here's sort of an interesting idea. So we're going to treat the code. Remember, so the, the code symbols, um, this is what we said here, the d ray alpha of it are the numbers from 0 to d minus 1. So that means that we can actually write it as a fractional number. Now, d, this is 0. Point y1, y2, y3, up to yl. And what this really means is, is this, is, is the right-hand side of the expression. It's basically each digit is multiplied by d of the negative digits from j, and then we're summing up the whole thing. And just to give you an example of this, let's say that d is the binary alphabet, and 0 0.1 is 1 half, 0 0.01 is 1 fourth, 0 0.11 is 3 fourths, 0 0.001 is 1 eighth. So basically, that's not the decimal point, it's the binary point. It's binary fractional numbers. But, you know, is there anything special about d, you know, d is equal to 2? No. I mean, this could be for any, it could be for 10, it could be for 16, it could be for 433. Doesn't matter. In all cases, this is the expression of what that number means. So what we're going to do then, each one of these finite length code words, we're going to associate with an interval. It's going to be half open interval, so the left hand, left half, and the left side is going to be closed. And on the right half, it's going to be open. So it's closed on the left half, it's a square bracket here, and open on the right half, circular bracket here. And here's another example. So the interval, by the way, so let me just make sure this is clear. So we're starting with this fractional number, and then we're ending with the same fractional number plus 1 over d to the l. So what that's going to do is it's going to, in some sense, add, this isn't clear, it's going to add 1 to the right-hand side digit, to the, the, the digit at position l. And so if that digit is between 0 and L minus 2, it's just going to add 1 to that digit. If that digit, this, this digit here that, that has the red arrow, is at D minus 1, then the digit's going to become 0, and the, and, the, and the next digit to the left is going to become incremented. And then similarly, that's going to potentially propagate forward. So it's just like counting in base 10, but it's base, base D, fractional. Is that clear? So this value, 1 over d to the l, adds 1 to this. So in other words, sorry, if this isn't clear, I don't know if this is clear. What this really is is 0 0.000 dot 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 0, or sorry, 1, where this is in the same position. This, this value is the same as this value. Let me know if that's clear. They're all zeros, except for the last one, which is a 1. <coughs> I hope that's clear. That, if you understand that, then you're, then you're doing great. Raise your hand if you understand that. So here's an example of going exactly that. So with d is equal to 10, then if, then if we've got 0 0.157, then the associated interval adds 1 and 0. Uh, 0.157 in the left, open, close, and 0.158 in the right, open. And if, if it's 0.159, then the, then the open interval is 0 0.159, 0 0.160. Right, that's just an example. And here's how it looks. So the interval starts, it's closed, and it's open. And, and what, what is the length of this? What are the lengths of this interval? So tell me what the length of this, this interval is. Somebody. Right. So the length of this interval is 
1 over d to the L i. That's very good. So the interval code for code work corresponds to the set of all real numbers. That interval is the set of all real numbers that begins with this fraction. And hence, it's a subinterval of the unit interval. We're never going to go over 1, right? Because um, we're only adding, we're only going to be open, we're open on the right, and we're only adding one digit on the left hand side, and we're always going to be at least that far away from the number 1. So we'll never actually touch 1. Now, the other thing, it's. Um, It's a prefix code, so the intervals must be disjoint. Why? Because the only way we can get an overlap of the interval is if um, one number which starts with, say, this string, we've got another number which starts with this string and then continues on. But it's a prefix code, but just by definition, the y's are not prefixes of each other. So all of the numbers in that interval start with that string. So that any other interval corresponds to starting with a different string, which is, not, which is neither a prefix of this one, nor is this a prefix of the other one. So the intervals, hence, therefore, are disjoint, because the intervals start with different strings, or start with different fractional numbers. So the intervals have no overlap. Now, the length of each interval is d to the negative li. And since all of the intervals lie in this range, they're disjoint, at most we can cover the whole unit interval. And so the, so the biggest coverage we could possibly get is 1. But in, in general, it's going to be less than or equal to 1. So therefore, it satisfies craft. Now, the proof of the converse of this theorem, based by saying, you know, uh, if we've got craft, we can find it. It's actually exactly analogous to the finite case. We just keep doing it forever. But I mean, it basically uses an infinite sum. Starts with craft. We're never going to run out of stuff. We're never going to run out of code words because we're never eliminating all of it. We just sort all the lengths. So, okay. So, prefix codes and craft inequality go hand in hand together. Any questions about this, this proof idea or these intervals? Yeah. So what's the consequence? Uh, so we get to find the set of uh, links that satisfy this. There's no way we can satisfy the word enumeration. Yeah, you're anticipating what we're about to talk about next. So we haven't talked. We, I've said. I've said. So I've said that craft is going to somehow connect us to. We can with craft we can construct a code, but now we can sort of use these things hand in hand. And rather than talking about a specific code, we can instead just talk about craft. Now, craft is something that maybe we can feed into an optimization problem to find the length. Now, basically, the problem of finding an instantaneous code becomes finding set of lengths that sets that craft. So now we have a mathematical constraint that can be expressed in terms of the length. And finding the code is, code is an afterthought. It's easy once we've got the length. But this is what happens. So now all we need to do is make sure that, and you'll see in a minute, you'll like this. This is kind of fun. There's some, some really cool things that pop out of this that you will. I think everybody will really enjoy. Everyone will get chills when you see this next result. Maybe, I don't know. So our goal is to find a prefix code with minimum expected length. So there's the expected lengths, right? And remember, craft and prefix code goes hand in hand. We can just work with craft and just forget about prefix code. Since once we've satisfied craft, we can easily construct a prefix code. So what about this? It's a constrained optimization problem. An integer programming problem. We minimize the expected length over the set of integer lengths. These are the z plus plus. These are the positive integers. So the z and it's um, gets to the m or something. Uh, to be technically correct, if we're uh, this is to the m. So um, and then we have a constraint, which is craft's inequality. We we have to satisfy craft. Always. So it's a math, and this is great. This is what craft buys us. 
So is this good? No. This is not good because integer programming is an incomplete optimization problem. Is this a linear integer program? Well, it's a linear objective. I mean, but it's the constraint layer. So it's not even a linear integer program. It's a nonlinear integer program. So I mean, even linear integer programs are hard, and this is a nonlinear integer program. So this is this is tough. However, let's um, solve it uh, using a Lagrangian form. And we construct our objective function with a Lagrange multiplier. Uh, take the derivative with respect to the lengths, and we get this expression, which um, basically, uh, when we set it to 0, we solve. For the length, we get d to the negative l is equal to this, and we get uh, we're going to get something else in a minute. But now we take the objective, derivative of the objective with respect to the Lagrange multiplier, and we get essentially crafts form of graph, but this, and this has to be equal to zero as well, and so we, we can solve from this for uh, the branch multiplier, the lambda is equal to 1 over L and D, we plug that in to 3.9, we plug um, this into 3.9, the lambda, and we get an expression from which we can actually solve for the length which satisfies this, and Hmm. Right, is, anyone, is, is anyone getting the chills yet? Are you getting it? Are you feeling it in your stomach? It is unique, right? It's unique. I mean, it's, the only, it's log, it's base, it's only some base. If d is equal to 2, <coughs> then it's our measure of information somehow magically popped out. Remember the information about an event that we talked about in lecture 1? So the length, the optimal length of the code, a word for this code symbol, i, it's not necessarily the integer. Let's not worry about that. This is the optimal length. We've relaxed the integer integrality uh, properties. But, but the optimal length is the information about that, that uh, event using the log function. So this is really, this is really fundamental, I think, because basically it's telling us that Information is description length, quite literally. The information about something is how long it takes to describe it, In the, or the minimal amount of, you know, how I shouldn't say how long it takes. I mean, obviously, if you're if you're if you, it's the minimal amount of length it takes to describe it. That's what it really means. This is, I think, this should be hugely eye-opening for everybody. So what does this imply? L star, the optimal expected length, is equal to the expected of these optimal lengths, which is equal to this, which is equal to the entropy, you know, the base D entropy. D is equal to 2, it's just regular old entropy. And as we know, the entropies are all related to each other by a multiplicative constant. So it's just changing the base of the log. Here's, right, here's, here's the, the constant of that, using log base 2. So the optimal expected length is the entropy. So that's the best you can do, according to this optimization form. Now, this is assuming that we're allowed to have fractional code lengths. Now, in general, when we're talking about bits or we're talking about a sequence, we can't like send all right three and one fourth bits. Right? That computers don't work that way. That's just not. We don't allow fractional bits. I think I already said this. So this is the this is the MDL principle, minimum description length principle. It tries to find the simplest explanation. This is also an instance of Occam's razor. Find as simple an explanation of a phenomenon as possible. That's the quote at the beginning of the book, Einstein's quote, where he says, make an explanation as simple as possible, but no simpler. You know, you want it to be as simple as possible so you don't lose information, but any simpler you lose information.
Okay, so let me ask you a question then. So if we compare these fractional code word lengths to long block codes, what's the relationship? I mean, we're going to talk about this. If, you, if it's not clear, yet, we'll, I will answer this in a few slides. But there is a relationship because obviously, you know, when we're coding one symbol at a time, you know, what's the question is what's a symbol? We have one source symbol. We're coding it one source symbol at a time. We get these optimal lengths, which are in units of fractional bits. We can't do that, right? So we have to do something. We have to do something integral. The actual integer programming problem is hard. We can't solve that. So we don't actually know what the optimal integral lengths are. But what we can do is, with long block lengths, make, um, in some sense, the average per symbol length fractional. Because now what we're doing is we're not, we're not um, requiring every symbol to have an integral length, but we're encoding a bunch of symbols, source symbols together. So then we take aggregates and averages and divide by the length of the block. It's suddenly the case that, you know, as n gets bigger, as the block gets bigger, we can approximate any given fraction, even if these, these optimal non-integral lengths are irrational. As the block lengths get bigger, we can approximate those optimal lengths on average more and more accurately as the block length gets longer. So is it as simple as saying, like, if I don't care about a 1% um, inefficiency, I'll just take 100 for the length of my block, and then, and then the fractional bit is only 1% of the that, that would be one way of looking at it, yes. I mean, uh, obviously, there's going to be a hit associated with that. There's latency hits and other sorts of real-world practical issues. Because as soon, you know, we, already thought, we, we already saw what happens with long block lengths and things with typical. So what you might have thought when we started talking about practical coding is like, ah, we can get away with long block length. But what we're going to see is, is in some sense or another, blocks are inevitable. Or what we'll also see, especially when we get to arithmetic coding, is that stream coding is, is possible. So you can actually, in some sense, get the benefits of long blocks where using things called stream codes. That you can still have, in some sense, Rapid, or sorry, low latency decoding for a stream, but the the asymptotic rates of long block lengths. How do we get the set of block lengths from that? Well, we will talk about that. I just want to. This is just sort of planting the idea in your mind. We will we will go over that in great detail. So for right now, what we've got is that entropy is the minimum expected length. That is the expected length of, of any instant code which satisfies craft inequality for random variable x is such that the length is no less than the entropy. And actually, we have equality, if it's possible, if the probabilities are such that d to the negative l is equal to the probability. So we can get exactly equal to the entropy if there's a constraint on the length. Now, what is that constraint, I, I think? Um, actually, I'll talk about that in a minute. But first of all, let's prove this, this theorem. So basically, this is showing that the expected lengths where we're satisfied this graph is greater than the entropy. So what we want to do is show that this thing, L minus H, is greater than or equal to zero. So L is the expected length, which is this part here. And the entropy is this part here, right? And let's just um, do this log base D of D to the negative L is the same as, um, as L, we've also removed the negative sign here. So there's a negative sign on the left here. And let's um, now just write it just vertically stacked. on. This is the same thing, vertically stacked, but what we're going to do now is add 0. So let's add 0 here. So it's plus the quantity minus the quantity. But now what we're going to do is combine these three things and use the fact that we can define R as this ratio. So R is going to be a number between 0 and 1. In fact, R i forms the probability distribution. 
And so when we use that definition of R and, def and combine these three things here, these three terms, we get the following. So this part is the same as this part here. And these three things combined with this definition of R gives us this part. Oh, it's completely wrong. Let me backtrack a minute. So um, this part here <laughs> is the same as this part here. And then the thing I said before was also completely wrong. So this, these three things combined with this definition of R is going to give us this part here. That's better, right? I don't know if you can see that. The light blue doesn't show up that well on this screen. But I mean, you can kind of see it just by combining the logs and R in the range denominator. OK, so now what happens? So, well, this is just the KL divergence between P and R. And the second quantity is log of 1 over C. And the only thing we need to know about C, C is just basically that sum. But we know that C is less than 1. So log of 1 over C, where C is greater than 1. So 1 over C is going to be greater than 1. So that log is going to be uh, greater than 1. It's not going to be negative. It's greater than 0. It's not going to be um, a negative value. And we know that the kolbach lyapunov divergence is greater than 0. So the whole thing, we, we end up with that the whole quantity, this is going to be greater than equal to 0. OK, so we've got our result that the expected length is no less than the entropy. Now we can actually get equality. So where, where is the inequality? Um, the, the inequality comes about by um, this, this quantity here, right? And we can actually then get equality by setting P is, pi is equal to L the, the negative Li. And that, that happens if um, this quantity, the information, is an integer. So if the, if the information about an event, if these are integral value, then we get equality. And remember we said before, like for example, when we talked about um, the Shannon's first theorem that said that we can get epsilon close to the entropy if we use long block lengths for any epsilon. But what happens at the, at the entropy? How do we get the entropy? It depends on the circumstance. And so in this particular case, what we're saying is that in this circumstance, we can actually achieve the entropy. You know, we can compress, compress exactly at the entropy if we're lucky enough that the probabilities have this property. That for some base d, we have um, integral valued lengths. So in which case, you know, then we have that C is equal to 1, as I said earlier. So what, let's, let's give this a name. So a probability distribution is called d attic with respect to d if each of the probabilities is d to the negative n for some n. So the, these, log, these lo, negative log probabilities will be integer if each probability is d to the negative n for some integer n. That's the so here's an example for when d is equal to 2. 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, 1 1 eighth corresponds to 2 to the negative 1 to the negative 2. So it has to be some negative power of 2. If we come up with a set of probabilities that sum to 1 and each probability is 2 to the negative sum integer, those are dyadic and those will have integer lengths for base 2. So for symbol sizes of 2, if we want to do binary, it might be the case that for ternary, ternary alphabets we can get integer lengths, whereas binary we can't, or vice versa. In general, it's not true. So, um, okay, so to summarize what we've just shown, uh, in the relaxed optimization problem, when we don't require integral lengths, then we can get the exact entropy with non-integral code lengths. Assuming Kraft is true, we've got that the expected lengths, the integral lengths, are going to be greater than or equal to the entropy. Um, and then with d attic distributions, we can get integral, integral lengths and actually still achieve the entropy. Um, and if we assume that Kraft is true and they're not d attic, 
then, you know, again, we have this inequality, but in fact, we have it strictly. So when we don't have dyadic distributions, we can't achieve the entropy exactly for any, you know, finite block size. But we can get arbitrary close, as we know, by increasing the block size. Now that, that point about block size hasn't come up yet in this specific context. Um, okay, so let's, I think, I think it's worth taking a break now before we talk about Shannon codes. So um, let's take a break. Okay, so let's start again with the uh, click and half. So what we have is then this is sort of our our you know relative loss in some sense. It's basically we've got the expected length minus the entropy, and this is a measure that when non-zero, it's all, always going to be L minus H is always going to be non-negative, and when it's going to be strictly positive, it means we're not doing as well as potentially, at least in theory, we could do. So how do we, in general, then find, um, find a code? So what we could do is, in order to, to code, what we would do then is find the closest in the KL sense to make the kolbeck leibler divergence small. So here's the kolbeck leibler divergence here. To make this guy small, we're going to full, find the closest, uh, in the KL sense, dyadic distribution with respect to D, um, you know, the, the alphabet size. Um, and then construct the code as in the proof of the Kraft inequality, right? Or the Kraft inequality converse. But unfortunately, you know, finding dyadic distributions is in general hard. Again, it's, it's, it's as hard as the and be complete optimization problem for finding the optimal integer code lengths. It's the integer programming problem. So we can't do that. So then what Shannon then proposed, even before knowing about the NP-completeness problem, was to say, okay, well, what about this? How about we just say, you know, we take lengths corresponding to the seal of the optimal fractional code length. So inside Inside, remember, log of 1 over p is the optimal, optimal fraction, and taking the seal is, is the seal function is just the next biggest integer. So if it's already an integer, great, you're done. If it's not an integer, you round it up to the next integer, and that becomes our length. So how bad is that going to do? So we compute, um, well, first of all, is, does this satisfy Kraft? Obviously, we have to make sure that we satisfy Kraft, because if we don't satisfy Kraft, then all kinds of bad things happen, like we might not have a prefix code. Let's make sure we satisfy craft. And so for these lengths, we take the sum of d to the negative li, and we plug in our lengths here. And then we take the upper bound, which is essentially just removing the seal function. And so this gives us our upper bound. But now the d and the log cancels out. Remember, it's a log base d. All the logs are base d here. And so we sum over p, and that's equal to 1. So therefore, we've got that the that Kraft inequality is satisfied. So these lengths are OK. All right, good. Now what about the expected length? Now we have a, a bound on the length. So we have that certainly each length that we're using is no more well, it certainly it's, it's greater than or equal to the optimal length, and it's no more than the optimal length plus 1. So each individual length is no worse than one additional bit. So maybe this isn't so bad. If the optimal lengths are already in the millions, one additional bit per length is not so bad. Right. Now, if we take the expected value with respect to the distribution p on both sides of 9.21, basically we're just sort of doing expected value of, of this whole thing, applying it to each side, the inequality still holds since everything is uh, you know, linear in the expected value. And so what we end up getting is that the entropy, or the expected length, then is sandwiched between the entropy and the entropy plus 1. 
So on average, our code word lengths using the Shannon lengths are going to be no worse than 1 greater than the entropy. So only one extra bit. Is this good? Pretty good, right? Who says thumbs up? Who says thumbs down? Who says thumbs sideways? See, these are jokes that work for six-year-olds. Um, I have a six-year-old at home. They work for, for him. Um, so, um, before we answer that question, whether it's good, let's look at the optimal length. So we certainly know that the optimal integer lengths are no less than the entropy, right? Now we have these lengths, L, and we've said that these lengths, these Shannon lengths, are no worse than one more than the entropy. Okay. So um, what that means is that then the optimal length are also more, more than the entropy. I guess the other point here is that it's possible that the optimal lengths, you know, the ones that um, are integral and are the best possible integer lengths, if we could solve this and we could take problem, they might not be, uh, they might not satisfy crap. That's okay. The point is that, for right here, that we're showing that the optimal lengths have the same sort of sandwich bound as our Shannon lengths. Now the question really we want to answer is, however, is this really a good thing? And we'll answer that in a minute. All right, this is just a summary. So basically the average overhead of using integers rather than fractional code words is no more than one bit per symbol on average. And in practice. So how bad is the overhead? That's what we want to ask. So let's look at the efficiency. So the efficiency of a code is the entropy divided by the um, expected length. And the entropy is fixed. The expected length is potentially variable depending on what length we plug in. And, the low, and we know that this is a number between 0 and 1. And obviously we can use terrible lengths and use really bad efficiency. In fact, if we don't compress at all, in some sense that's what that is doing. What we're doing when we're coding, when we're compressing, is, is boosting the efficiency by making the expected lengths smaller. And the optimal efficiency, which means that when we've achieved the Shannon rate, the optimal efficiency is 1. So then, now we have the expected length of the Shannon code is the entropy plus 1. So then, as the entropy gets big, the efficiency goes to 1. So for big entropies, big overall entropies, the, um, the efficiency is pretty good, 1 bit one extra, one value, one, an increment of one to the entropy is not so bad for big entropies. On the other hand, when the entropy is small, um, the efficiency goes to zero. Right? If, if, let's say that we've got this extraordinarily compressible source, right? like it's almost a constant random variable. If we're I mean, in fact, if it's a zero random variable, if it's a deterministic random variable, you don't even need to compress. You just say, it's always three. And now you're sending, every time you're sending a three, you're using a bit to say that it's a three, when you already know it's a three. So that's, that's, that's not very efficient. Right? That, that's kind of like Fox News, right? So if you already know what they're going to say. There are no, there are no, you know what they're going to be saying. That's going to be anti, you know, all these things. How much information is there? How much efficiency is it? It's a lot of words for a lot of a little message. So, um, yeah, I shouldn't be saying this on, on recording. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the expected length of the code is easy, similar to the rate of the code. So, in the block code, we have a rate of the code. Right yeah. So this is this. It is the rate of the code, right? So the expected length is the average number of bits per source symbol. Right? So in a block code, remember we're coding a block of source symbols simultaneously, so we have to divide by the block length. So far, what we've really talked about here is the block length of size 1. So the, so the rate of the code, in terms of the block length, is always divided by 1, so it doesn't really have an effect. 
but we haven't yet introduced block coding into <coughs> this into the current paradigm yet, and we will do that soon. And you might actually, from this slide, right away see why we want to start using blocks. Because what do blocks do? Well, if we have um, a single source random variable with low entropy, how do we increase the entropy? Consider a lot of them. Even if they're IID, the entropy gets bigger. And if we code them jointly, we're still going to get an additional increment by one over the overall entropy of the block penalty. And, and that, on average, is not going to be so bad. So that's, that's where we're going with this. But I, I have slides for that. So the point is that for small alphabets, when the alphabet is size is small, or, for ter or deterministic random variables, just say small alphabets, or deterministic random variables, or approximately deterministic random variables, it's impossible to have good efficiency. So for example, like if the alphabet size is, is um, binary, then the maximum of the entropy is 1. So the best possible efficiency is 50%. That's not so good. So in this sense, then these sort of single symbol codes are inherently disadvantaged unless their distribution happens to be dyadic, which is almost never the case. But this is where block coding comes in. We can improve the efficiency by rather than coding one symbol at a time, we can code at a block at a time, or a vector of, at a time. And so now what happens in some sense is that the symbol, the alphabet, becomes a Cartesian product of the alphabet, where it's a Cartesian product over the alphabet block length times. If the block length is n, then it's, then it's the alphabet x cross x cross x n times. So our, al our, our alphabet is, is increased suddenly. And moreover, our entropy is increased. So let's say that this is the expected length of n symbols. And then ln is the expected per symbol length when encoded n symbols. So let's, let's write this down. So we're, we're now let's zoom in on this. So we're, it's, it's the length, the length of this block. It's the length n block. It's the probability of that block. And we're dividing by n, so it's the expected per source symbol length by encoding of a block. But now, you know, we can do the same sort of things where we take the length and we derive the length using, say, the Shannon length, based on the log of the probability. So let us, in fact, do that. Let's use the Shannon length. So now the probability, p of i, so it, it used to be the case that i, in, in this expression down here, I used to range over just the symbols in the source alphabet, but now it's ranging over an alphabet that's, whose size is growing exponentially in the block length. So the alphabet size is getting big, fast. And, so, and similarly, the probabilities are getting small, fast. And so, therefore, log of 1 over p is getting big, fast. And that 1 at the very end on the right-hand side is becoming negligible fast. Especially when we take the expected value. So we take the expected value. This is basically just, you know, it's, it's taking the expected value of all sides. And on the left, you've got the entropy of the block. On the right, we've got the entropy of the block plus 1. And in the middle, we have um, the expected length expected block length. So now if we divide everything by n, if, you know, for example, first of all, if let's say everything is iid. So if everything is iid, then, then the joint entropy is equal to n times the singleton entropy. That just makes the analysis particularly easy. And so if we divide everything by n, we've got the per symbol length in this block coding scheme is sandwiched between the entropy and the entropy plus 1 over n. And as the, block length has, that's, it, as the block length gets big, 1 over n goes to 0. So therefore, the per symbol length, just like we saw in the typical set case, 
the first symbol length approaches the entropy. And this is just the simple Shannon code lengths. So what we've done is like we've got this is now this is we're we're using the distribution. We're using lengths that that we know satisfy crafts. We can actually go ahead and build an instantaneous code thanks to the fact that this, the lengths satisfy craft. And if we use a long enough block length, we'll do a good job compressing. And all we need to know is the marginal distribution of the single sources. This is the IID case. But, you know, once again, we have to code using a block, which basically means all of the things, you know, if we want to get really close to the entropy, we have to use a long block length. And if we use a long block length, if it's a stream, we have to wait for the entire block to arrive before we can decode it, which means that there's latency, and it means that there's memory involved. If, it, if we were to implement this, we need to store it, um, and all of those bad things. And like I said, this is something that is true of all block codes. So when you run gzip, the way gzip essentially works, I mean, roughly speaking, I mean, it does all sorts of things. But one, one you might see like the, the block length used, and a lot, especially a lot of the older compression algorithms is that basically they use, they decide upon a block length in advance, and they decide upon a, essentially a piece of length of text and then they build these statistics, they, they estimate these probability distributions and then they go back over over that again and then and then um, uh, compress using that, that block length and those estimated probabilities and one of the parameters sometimes of the compression algorithms is how long a block length you want to use which basically and, and if you use longer block length it takes more compute and more memory but you can do better Compression usually when you increase when you that's that's sort of essentially what the strength parameter is on some of these compression algorithms. They're they're doing a lot more much more sophisticated things, but this is sort of the basics of what some of those programs are doing. More so, I think in the in the old days, like in the nineties, like BZIP and those sorts of things. Actually, I don't know what BZIP is doing these days. They're probably doing much more sophisticated things, but that's what they used to be doing roughly. So yeah. we cannot apply essentially you estimate the probability and then come up with the code. Yep. You go through the file, I mean, you, you partition the file, you go through a chunk of the file, estimate the probabilities, go through again, compress it. Take the next chunk of the file, estimate the probabilities, and okay. compress so it. The well, that's usually a command line parameter. Usually there's, oh. a de there's a default. But the block length is something, like there's a default block length. But it depends on the, the distribution. Yeah. So you don't, you, you don't really know until you try it what's going to work best. For, for a given source file, text file. The other issue that we haven't talked about yet, which we will talk about, is that you know the distributions can change. Like the, the, over a length of file, if we take a length of file at the beginning of a document and at the end of a document, the distributions might be very different. So there's a trade-off between using long windows of file to estimate the distributions, which might not be applicable to any sort of local region within the file. But on the other hand, there's sort of estimation error. We're not actually we're not going to be talking about estimation errors. How do you estimate p of x? But if you use a small window of file, then you get lots of error in, in, in your estimation of p of x. So there's no it's sort of like a it's one of those standard things like in time frequency. There's sort of, sort of length and uh, in, in length you have no sort of temporal or temporal specificity. Same basic idea. But if the length of the file cannot be divided by the block time of block. So the length of the file is 12? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, you, you always have to do windowing things at the end. Like, maybe you have to do some padding with zeros or something. There's always things, tricks you have to do. And if we have it there, the distributor Yeah, you get some inefficiencies. Yeah. I mean, you're you're going to do some bad things. But that's only at the beginnings or in the end. Usually that doesn't that doesn't happen a lot. I mean, you've got to do something at the end. You might just repeat it and just mark it as, as being repeated, and then when you decompress, don't spit it out. Or, you know, it doesn't matter really. 
you know, as long as you just, that's something that only happens on the fringes and you do something to make sure that when you decompress you get the same thing. Now, but another thing about this that's kind of interesting is that, you know, it's independent. These symbols are independent, but it's better to code jointly because you get expect better expected lengths that are better than these integer lengths that you would have to round up to. So the pen, so the this one over n is better not because there's any dependence in in the probability. These are still IID random variables, but by coding jointly, you have more options for for code word lengths. Or I should say that the code word lengths are more appropriate for the set of independent symbols. Now, in the case when um, it's a stationary ergodic stochastic process, we've got kind of the same thing. It's no longer the case that the joint entropy turns into a sum, but what we get is the expected length satisfies this sandwich here. And this now, basically, when n gets big, the expected length converges to the entropy rate of the stochastic process. Remember, that the joint entropy over n converges to what we defined as the rate when it exists. And now the expected length, using the same procedure um, in the stationary case, converges to the rate. And again, when you use longer and longer block lengths, the one over n, this, you know, the one under, over n in act, um, Suboptimality becomes smaller and smaller. So this is the n gets large, the expected length of the code goes to the entry rate of the stochastic process. So this, this is nice. And again, with long block lengths, we can make the penalty as small as we want. And here's the essentially the theorem version of this statement. So the minimum expected code word length satisfy the sandwich, and in the stationary case, we approach the entropy. Okay, so the other thing that typically happens, which we would like to analyze, is the fact that, you know, in general, as we were talking about when we were actually compressing files, you know, we're only estimating the distribution. You know, we, don't, we don't really have P of X. You know, we estimate the distribution, we have Q. Now there's an enormous number of ways of estimating the distribution. And the question is, which way do we choose? Well, we don't know. We, that's not what this, this particular class is about. That's density estimation problems. But suppose we come up with some method. The question is, what sort of penalty might we expect to see? Now, by penalty, we mean how many extra bits per symbol are we likely to pay? How much higher is the rate going to be? So let's say that. The Shannon, let's use Shannon lengths. And Shannon would say, okay, well, these are my lengths. I'm going to use the C of log of 1 over Q, where Q is our estimated probability distribution for P, and, it, and these guys are not necessarily the same. P and P, let's just say that they're not the same. So how much does this hurt? So let's look at the expected length under this case. So now we've got the expected value under P of the C of log of 1 over Q which, when we unintegerize it, we can give it this upper bound. And what we're doing here is we're just multiplying and dividing by p of x, which is 1. And that's going to allow us to break it into two terms, which consists of this term here and this term here. And the 1 is still sitting there from before. And so what we get then is that the expected length is equal to the kolbach leibler divergence between P and Q and the entropy and, and 1. So when this is a, a standard, this is a strict, this is a generalization of what we saw before, because when P is equal to Q, of course, this is equal to 0. So we get that the expected length is um, I should say, the expected length is less than or equal to entropy plus 1. But now we're saying that there's an additional suboptimality term, which is the kolbeck leibler divergence, between the true and the estimated distribution, Q. So again, we say you know, kolbeck leibler is kind of a fundamental concept. It's like 
the, the bit penalty in using the wrong distribution. And this, in this sense, it, it's, it, it's exactly the bit penalty. So here's the theorem version of that. So the expected lengths under the true distribution P with approximate distribution Q under the Shannon length case satisfies this sandwich. So notice that um, if we even use long, very, very long block lengths, but the wrong distribution, we have still a penalty, which is this. So the best we can do, we can never get closer than the kullback liability divergence between P and Q to the entropy if we're using the wrong distribution. So, because this, this left-hand side here becomes the lower bound. So this is what this is saying. The left-hand side is the best we can do with using the wrong distribution Q when the true distribution is P. Okay, questions? Okay, so remember our collection of code classes. So we proved that craft inequality is true for instantaneous codes and vice versa. Uh, the question is, could craft inequality be true for all uniquely decodable codes? Um, well, uh, maybe is it possible that if, you know, we've got the uniquely decodable or the instantaneous codes in the green ellipse in the middle, maybe if we, if we allowed ourselves to um, not satisfy, well, maybe, maybe we could actually go to uniquely decodable, and maybe with some additional computation and memory, at least it's still uniquely decodable, Maybe we could do a little bit better. That's sort of the idea. And maybe if craft is true, is, is craft is true, like maybe is craft a good surrogate for codes other than instantaneous codes? That's really the other question. Could this larger class of codes have a longer, or sorry, have shorter expected code lengths? And since it's a larger class, we might, you know, hope possibly that we could do better. And that, that would end up being naive as we're about to show. And the theorem states that code word lengths of any uniquely decodable code even those that are not necessarily instantaneous, must satisfy the craft inequality. So remember, what craft inequality said was instantaneous must satisfy craft, and craft inequality means that there exists an instantaneous code that satisfies those lengths. This is, this is saying something that uniquely decodable must also satisfy craft. And since it satisfies craft, and since all, uniquely, since all instantaneous codes are uniquely decodable, the converse of this theorem is already proven. Right? Given a set of code word lengths, it's impossible to construct a uniquely decodable code. Well, we've already shown that it's possible to construct an instantaneous code. And an instantaneous code is a uniquely decodable code. So all we, have, all we really need to do is show that um, if you're uniquely decodable, you must satisfy craft. This is another interesting um, proof idea, which will be useful for understanding concepts later. So we only prove the first part. Okay, everybody understand that last point? Everybody understand the statement of the theorem? Yes? Is today's lack of sunshine having a soporific effect? Or maybe I have, I'm have. i imparting a soporific effect on everybody. Or maybe I'm soporific. I don't know. So we are given a uniquely decodable code. It's not necessarily instantaneous, it's with lengths L. So all we know about the code is that it's uniquely decodable. So how do we go about proving this? This is interesting. And we've got a code extension, a K extension to K source symbols, which just sums the lengths. And we want to prove that those lengths satisfy um, craft. Right? Well, let's just find F as our, as our sort of quantity. This is the thing that we want to show is, S is the thing we want to show is less than or equal to 1. Okay. 
So then what we can do is raise that quantity to the k. So raise s to the k, which basically means raising this quantity to the kth power. Just by the definition of k. Um, when we expand out this polynomial, and we're writing the sum in a slightly more explicit form where we're summing over all possible symbols in the k extension of the source symbol set, we've got um, this set of negative powers of d multiplied together. This is polynomial expansion. And we can then put everything inside of the same exponent of d to the negative something, and we just sum up the lengths, and that becomes d to the negative length of the of the code extension, the k extension in this case. And then we can write it in this way. Now, what this is doing is this is summing. Let's just zoom in a little bit on this to make sure we understand everything. What this guy here is doing is saying, for every possible source sequence of length k, take d to the negative the length of the code word for that source sequence. And what this sum is doing here is we're summing over all of the possible lengths. These are the, the shortest possible length is 1. The largest possible length is k times l max, where l max is the longest, is the, is the, is the length of the longest uh, code word length for an individual source symbol. Okay, so these are all of the possible lengths. You know, A of M is going to be the number of source sequences that have that particular length, and then all of them are, are, are multiplied by D to the negative M. So that, that's going to be the same quantity. So it's just writing the sum in a different way. Does everybody see how, that is, how you get that? So another way of saying it's like break this this first sum into a bunch of terms. Like this is just a term. It doesn't matter how, what order we sum them in. Right? Let's take the first terms. Like all right, all the guys who are length one, put them in the first batch. All the guys who are in the next who have length two, put them in the next batch. All the guys who are length three, put them in the next batch. So all of the all of the source symbols of length k that have code words length one, put them in, the, in one bag. All of the source symbols whose code words have length 2, put them in the next bag, and just put, have different bags associated with code words of different lengths. And then count how many guys are in each bag, and A of M, so each, everybody in the same bag has the same code word length, they just count how many are in each bag, and A of M is the number of code words in bag M. And each one of them then is multiplied by D to the negative that length. That makes sense now. Maybe look at it. This is just saying that same thing. So L max is the max maximum code word length, and A M is the number of source sequences. Here's a here's a mathematical definition of A M. So A M is equal to the set of the size of the set of code words whose length is equal to M. Or in other words, the size of the set of source sequences of length K whose code word length is equal to M. To counter the bag. Kind of bag So we have D of the M code words of length M, and each of them can have at most one associated source sequence. Right? And why is that? Because it's uniquely decodable. So now we're using the uniquely decodability. Um, and hence, A of M can't be any bigger than D to the M. It's the maximum number. So when we continue this equation, so we write this, s to the k is equal to this. Um, well, amm is, a, am is an upper bound of km. And this whole thing then becomes k times l max. Okay, so here's where it's sort of we get this neat, neat trick. And this is for all k. So on the left-hand side, we have an exponential in k. And the right-hand side, we have a polynomial on k. And this is true, and it's less than or equal to for all k. So what can s possibly be greater than 1? 
if s is greater than one, we have a growing exponential being less than a polynomial. Is that possible? No. We know that exponentials are, I mean, this is actually a linear function, okay, but we know that um, exponentials eventually, if, if, it's, if, it, if, the, if d is going to be greater than 1, eventually that's going to pass any polynomial, okay, that's going to go faster. And so therefore the only chance that that could actually be true would be is if d is, d is less than 1. So not d, s, but you have the idea. S, I said the wrong thing. It's s is less than 1. But s is the thing we want to show is less than 1, so basically means that the length satisfy craft. It's kind of a neat proof. So the point is the following. So the set of achievable coded lengths is, in a sense, the same for the uniquely decodable codes and for the instantaneous codes. So is there ever any benefit to go, to move away from the instantaneous codes into the in uniquely decodable code world? Can you get better expected lengths? No. Why? Because take any uniquely decodable code, its lengths must satisfy craft. I can take those lengths and then construct an instantaneous code with exactly the same length, and so therefore we'll have exactly the same expected length. So there's no benefit at all to moving to uniquely decodable. So that larger space of codes is useless. Because we still have this practical consideration we want to deal with. We can't say we can't say we didn't do anything practical in this class. We still want to be able to code with low computation and low memory. Um, and um, talking about practical, by the way, how did you like problem eleven on on homework three? Did people like that problem? I'm looking forward to seeing your solutions. That's the one I gave you an extra day to turn it in. Remember that one? Did people turn it in? Okay. For, I, don't, I don't remember seeing it on Tuesday. Yeah. Okay, we talked about it on Tuesday. Um, but, um, yeah, so, in any event, so the point is that in that, in that oval thing, that, that there's no benefit. This is only if you use the class as a What if we don't use the class? We come up with a different class. Um, and then set that bigger thing. Well, let's let's look at that for a minute. Let's find the slide. I thought it was going to be very slow here. There we go. So do we really want to move away from uniquely decodable to non-singular? Uh, I don't know. We just uh, optimize for, like, now the optimization is based on craft, right? Which constrains us to the instantaneous codes. It doesn't constrain us. What I'm saying is the following. That, it, in fact, craft, the whole point of this is that any, any point here, which is not instantaneous, but it is uniquely decodable, those code lengths must also satisfy craft. So suppose I give you a uniquely decodable code. Suppose I give you this one and say, here's my code, start using it, and you say it, and you tell me. But that's a, a real pain to decode. What are those lengths? And you look at those lengths and say, ah, I don't want to use your code. I'm going to use craft and construct a code that has exactly the same code word lengths and expected lengths and is instantaneous code. And you'll tell me, here's a better code. Why is it better? Because it's instantaneous. I don't have to wait till the end to find out what my first symbol is. Right. So the point is that there's no bet yet at the same time, since we know that any set of lengths here, there exists an instantaneous code that, set that has the same set of lengths, there's no benefit ever to go, going to the uniquely decodable code, because there's, 
you might think, oh, well, we have a more flexible code set, so maybe the set of lengths are more flexible, so therefore we can get a better compression rate. No, because why? I can take those lengths and construct an instantaneous code with exactly the same expected length. So I guess my question is that, what if we do unconstrained optimization for the problem? What if one try? Is there a chance to get something else? Well, the chance that you get something else, you can either get something here, suppose you do unconstrained, which is uniquely decodable, in which case you just got lucky and it just so happens to satisfy craft, even though you didn't put the constraint into the objective. Or you could get something here, you get really lucky, you get instantaneous, or you could get something here, which is non-singular. And as soon as you get something there, then, then, then you're going to get errors. right? I mean, because the non-singular codes are ones that can't, when you take the extension, you're going to get multiple code source symbols mapping to the same code word. Is that going to be good? No. I mean, so in some sense, the boundary of the uniquely decodable codes are the ones that we are lossless. And we're only talking about lossless compression here. If you want to start talking about lossy compression, there, there are other things maybe you could do. But then you sort of need to control for the type of distortion. You can't indiscriminate. Any sort of loss, lossy compression algorithm needs to be very, very careful as to the, to the type of distortion you're likely to get. And usually one, like for example, audio compression, that's a huge topic in and of itself that involves psychoacoustics and understanding about the human perceptual, the auditory perceptual system in designing the way that the distortion manifests itself such that it's non-perceptible or it's minimally perceptible. And you know, some people with golden ears hate MP3 files Neil Young, I always like to bash Neil Young because here's this guy who's been listening to 130 decibel rock music all his life and is probably close to being deaf and he's complaining about the sound of compact discs. So I, I, I think it's a, and he wants to go to 24 bit, uh, uh, 96 kilo, kilohertz sampling. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, um, the point is that just audio perception is needed for doing a lossy compression when there's distortion. And if you do visual compression, like a lossy visual, video compression, like all of the MP4 container things that live within MP4 files, you need to do visual perceptual experiments to say what kinds of distortions are more pleasing and what ones aren't. So yes, these codes are useful, but you have to be very careful. You can't just indiscriminately design them. So the quality is sufficient constraints for the decodable. Yes. That's all that uniquely decodable. It's necessary. It's necessary. So remember, from uniquely decodable we get craft. From craft we get instantaneous, and instantaneous is is, is uniquely decodable. So it's necessary and sufficient. So is there a one-to-one -one matching from uniquely decodable to Um. Well, the point is that the set of lengths are the same, but the set of codes are bigger. So, you know, the actual bit strings I get, there'll be more, like, think about all the possible uniquely codable codes. Any code, any code and its set of bit strings and its corresponding lengths will have a corresponding instantaneous code. So there might be multiple of these guys, like there might be a whole bunch of these guys that have um, the same instantaneous code. And then maybe multiple of these guys as well. In fact, as we know from I mean, one of the problems I asked, is like even when you have a set of lengths that satisfy craft, there are multiple ways of constructing instantaneous codes. So these these regions here are really bubbles, not points. So um, so, but that doesn't mean that the codes are the same because the bit strings might be different. So like this bit string might be different than this bit string might be different, but it's not until you map it here it is it become instantaneous prefix free. Right? So when we're talking about distortionless coding and symbol coding, craft is, is fundamental. That's why I'm saying it's such an important theorem because, um, because we can just work with this criterion. And there's no penalty. We're not really leaving the space of interesting codes. So the bottom line is that 
we can just consider instantaneous codes with relative or maybe actual absolute impunity. You know, I mean, there's, there's really no impunity when we're talking about distortionless symbol codes. So let me clarify that for distortionless. For distortion of symbol codes. That's not fur, it's for. Okay. Any questions? Um, okay. Now, what about Shannon? Let's go back to Shannon for a minute. In some real sense, you might think, okay, well, Shannon's, Shannon's are, Shannon codes are great, but in, in, for any sort of finite block length, Shannon codes might be highly suboptimal. Like here's, a, here's an example. This is a, an extreme example because it's a block length of size one, but let's say that um, the source alphabet is binary and the probability that x is equal to zero is like 10 to the negative 1,000th, and the probability of uh, x is equal to one is one minus that. And so, what are the Shannon lengths? So it's a binary alphabet source. We only really, as we know, we only need two bits to encode it. It's already binary, right? And so what Shannon lengths would say, well, let's use 3,322 bits for that one bit zero, and let's use one bit for the one bit one. Okay, so Shannon is, is being a little silly, right? Um, we're using 3,321 bits too many, right? So that's, um, in general, for other distributions, you know, we can construct cases where any given sort of individual code length is way, way too long. Well, remember, it's, it's, we're paying on average, if we take the expected value, you know, so the, the lengths themselves are not optimal for the individual lengths, but on average, we're paying one additional, we're paying one, you know, the entropy is increased by one. So the, so the expected length is entropy plus one at most. Now the reason for that is because of the expected value, because, you know, we're multiplying 3,322 by 10 to the negative 10,000, or whatever it is, 10 to the negative 1,000. But still, you know, for any given set of lengths, and this is, a, like I said, an extreme example, for, let's say we've chosen a reasonable size block length, like, n is equal to 50 or something. It's still the case that um, we may be paying more on average um, than necessary. So um, this is where Huffman codes um, come in. And what Huffman codes do is it's a procedure for finding the shortest expected length prefix code. So this is pretty cool. And we're not going to have really time to go into this. This is probably most of this. Actually, I'm going to say that I will put the rest of this section and this section on YouTube. So I will try to do it like tonight or tomorrow, probably tomorrow, or maybe Saturday at the most, at the longest. But please do watch the next couple of lectures on YouTube before you come to class on Tuesday. Because remember, Tuesday is only going to be a one-hour in-person class. And so I will assume that you have watched the Huffman section and the Shannon Fano Elias section because what I want to do on, my, on Tuesday is do this Shannon game, play a Shannon game, and also do midterm review, which we really should be doing in person. Whereas this Huffman stuff and the other stuff is more appropriate for YouTube. So we're going to get a little bit of a head. I mean, we're almost out of time now. But we're going to get a little bit ahead. So let's let's just go. Let's do like one or two more slides. I'm talking about Huffman, but really we're going to be doing Huffman on YouTube entirely. So um, has anyone actually looked at Huffman in uh, your computer science classes? And this is something that probably even in high school you learn now. You learn Huffman in high school computer science classes, junior high school, I know, kindergarten. <laughs> It's, um, it's become so fundamental. So what we're going to do is analyze it in a, in a way 
that maybe you almost certainly didn't do in your computer science classes. Um, with the tools that we've got now, you know, of, of information theory. So again, you know, our, our quest is in some sense the following. So we've got a probability distribution P, and we we want to find a code, um, which are basically bit strings and the corresponding lengths. That's as short as possible, and it's also prefix free. Now, the, one possible strategy for doing this would be to, in some sense, do this greedily. And now, this might not make sense at first, but basically what we're going to do greedy is sort of a procedure where we sort of st start at the top and split the potential code words into even probabilities. So remember, every single one of these code words corresponds to a tree. right? And doing a tree traversal from root to leaf as long as, you know, should give us a code word. Some leaf should give us a code word, and nothing below that leaf should give us a code word, because it's a leaf, right? So that's a prefix free property. And so how do we, in some sense, it, essentially designing a code essentially be, becomes a, a, a property of tree design. And so the first thing we have to do, if we're building a tree from, in some sense, the top down, is we start at the top of the tree, or the root of the tree. It's like, it's like an upside down tree, right? We start at the root of the tree, and we might split it this way. Let's say we're doing binary, and then we might, after we do that split, and say this is 0, 1, and we do another split 0, 1, and another split 0, 1. And so a greedy tree building procedure would start at the top and keep splitting, cursively splitting leaves. When we begin, we have only one leaf, which is a single node, and we'd split that. And one way of doing that might be to ask the question with the highest entropy. So this is exactly identical to the game of 20 questions that we saw before. We have a set of objects. Um, let's say we have a set of m objects without loss of generality that occur with frequencies proportional to these non-negative weights, w1 through wm. And what we want to do is we want to um, determine what object it is uh, by asking as few questions as possible. And the kind of questions we can ask are things like, for a given set, subset of the objects, we can ask, is x in a? So x is some random variable, and we're trying to determine what that random variable is, and we can ask these kinds of questions. And remember, each one of these questions has, there's a probability of that question being yes, and a probability of that question being no. And for each one of these questions, there's an entropy associated with that question, which is the entropy of the corresponding probability of it being yes, binary entropy. And then for doing binary splits of the tree, we might want to ask the questions first with the greatest entropy, because that's going to reduce the residual uncertainty, as we saw when we did the question answer, answer, answering uh, tree. So here's an example of the tree. So I think we're, we don't really have time to go into it, but so you get the idea of the, the questions, and also so I will introduce you to the YouTube lectures that you will next see. Um, so has anyone not seen a YouTube lecture that I've done this class? I hope I'm recording this one. Yes, I am. Okay, so everybody has. Okay, so I will now. I don't, then, so then, just to end the class, we're going to end here. But uh, are there any questions on anything? Yet, or at this point. Okay, so I will see you then on Tuesday.